Hello and welcome to Alchemy and Chemistry Part 11, The Three Alchemical Principles. The three alchemical principles are said to be salt, sulfur, and mercury. However, the alchemical definition may differ from the chemical definition in the modern sense. Let's go over the chemical definitions first. Let's begin with salt. Ordinary salt is sodium chloride. It's made of two atoms. Sodium, which is uh, Na, and that comes from the word natrium, uh, pertaining to the word natural, because it's a common substance. It's atom number 11. It's a metal. And when it's combined with chlorine, atom number 17, a gas, it becomes salt. So salt is actually two substances combined very with a very strong bond. And either of the two original substances are completely different. They have completely different properties. Sodium is a metal. It explodes in contact with water. There's no way you could consume it. It would kill you. Chlorine also, very destructive. Uh, it's a gas. But when you combine the two together, you get table salt, as you all know. Now sulfur, sulfur is atom number 16, also called brimstone. It's a monatomic, it's a single atom substance. And it has two different spellings, uh, one with a pH, one with an F. In the past, I think uh, pH was an older spelling. And I believe it, it has an etymology meaning to burn, if you go digging up the etymology of it. Coincidentally, if you put the word sulfur into Latin, uh, a, a Google Latin to English translator, and you misspell the word sulfur with an E, it comes to the English word, uh, English translation, think, spelt with an E. And apparently, uh, think, spelt with an E, is a third person version, an antiquated third person, person version of the word think. So that's pretty weird. But anyway, sulfur, as you know, is a yellow crystalline substance, a um, powder in many cases. It has a low melting temperature and it has a very large amount of uses. It's a very useful substance. If it gets a little too, if you melt it down and it gets a little too hot, it'll catch on fire and burn with a blue flame. Uh, the vapors from the smoke are very acrid. They're qu quite damaging to breathe in and uh, leave a real sting in your nostrils. Not something you want to do, but uh, sulfur is uh, quite an amazing substance. Now, mercury, on the other hand here, is uh, <clears throat> atom number 80. So it's a large, it's a large atomic structure. Again, a uh, single atom substance. It's been called quicksilver in the past. And the uh, Latin is hydrargyrum or hydrargyrum, however you pronounce it. And Hg is so, that Hg is the symbol for mercury uh, on the periodic table of atoms, right? But nobody ever calls it that. Um, it's called quicksilver or mercury. Now here's some mercury I have in a little jar here. I won't be opening the jar because the vapors of mercury are toxic to breathe in. And that's one of the most toxic parts of it. The oxide layer is also toxic. If you were to get the oxide layer, which you can see there's a little bit of like a corrosive, a uh, little bit of a dusty layer on the outside, that you would not want to be handling that or... Uh, consuming it. The liquid metal itself really isn't too too harmful, but the compounds of it that it produces are harmful. It has a very high density, a mirror finish, um, rather low viscosity, but yet a very high surface tension. And it does very odd things when vibrated. It's just a really amazing substance. This can be derived from a rock called cinnabar. 
and I believe it's a sulfur and mercury compound that occurs in nature and when you heat it it turns red and oozes mercury out of it which must have been an amazing discovery in the past it may have been the origin of metal um, where people decide to mine rocks and heat them until they get metal anyway so those are our chemicals and that's our chemical definition of those words let's uh, study the alchemical definition of those words so <clears throat> what are the alchemical definitions related to those three words salt sulfur and mercury well in the alchemical sense the word salt represents the body of something the word sulfur represents the soul of something and the word mercury represents the spirit of something there are other chemical definitions associated with those words for example in plant alchemy the soul is thought to be the oil the essential oil of the plant and the spirit of the plant is thought to be ethanol so in a older text if they were referring to the mercury of the plant it wasn't talking about metallic mercury they were talking about ethanol that was a process uh, derived from putrefic uh, fermentation and then distillation and that was a huge discovery it was studied in great detail in the past just the just the distillation process there they did many many things with that uh, because of what a big discovery that would have been so <clears throat> the meanings have changed over time the words salt sulfur and mercury represent principles as well as materials in the old language uh, you know, mercury may have been called quicksilver, sulfur may have been called brimstone, and salt has probably always been called salt or sal or saline from the Latin word saline for salt. So I think that the reason that we have this difference in language is because in the past the, the alchemists would have noticed some patterns about existence itself and tried to sort of mix that in with science. Also, you've got the religious influences of, of uh, the uh, Hellenistic period some 2,000 years ago. So, the philosophical idea of a soul and a spirit got mixed in with the study of science. And when you read the older text, you start to wonder, were they talking about a spiritual thing and it's veiled in some boring, like, chemistry discussion? Or were they talking about chemistry stuff and they just kind of covered their butt with the church by throwing in uh, phrases about spirits and resurrections and, uh, you know, preaching. Almost It comes across almost as a preachy tone that you need to have a certain pious outlook towards your chemical processes. So it's pretty, it's pretty interesting how much the, the language has changed over time. So the salt is going to be the body of something. It's probably the easiest to understand because if you take a plant, it's a, a, whether it's alive or dead, you burn it, you put that ash with water, you can extract the salt by letting the water dry out. It leaves behind the salt of the plant, and that's considered the body of the plant. Something more fluid is considered an essential oil, and then something more ethereal, hence the word ethanol for ether, even though ether is a different chemical, but the word ethanol comes from that same root language meaning ethos, something that vaporizes out of thin air, that was thought to be, must have been related to what a spirit is like. So, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll point out that in uh, different traditions, a soul and a spirit have different meanings. So, for example, in the Eastern tradition, a soul is sort of a continuous thread for all humanity. Um, and it's not an individual thing that one individual person possesses in Eastern uh, yogic traditions. Spirit is usually thought of as an individual's 
uh, mood or thoughts or essence, if you will. So there's some different ways, depending on what culture you're from, as to whether you see a soul and a spirit as individual to the one individual human or whether it's just a pool of consciousness that we all belong to. That's a, an interesting thing right there. We, uh, we may, may not know at this point, but... Uh, so the essential oils would be the soul of uh, the plant. Similarly, you know, there's oils that are from animals that get used in medicines and things like that. Um, but usually, and of course, biblical text, anointing oils. I mean, a lot of these, a lot of these things are linked to old religious text. If you care to read them, there's some alchemical references tied in, and you're it's. It, anybody's guess as to whether they were trying to hide one type of information while sharing another or or to tell two stories at once or or what so I find that to be pretty interesting uh, mercury being representative of spirit uh, you know that's gonna be again ethanol ethos and that's why liquor is called spirits hard liquor is called spirits and um, Mercury is also one where they had the namesake from the gods. So Mercury was the messenger of the gods, uh, delivering messages between, a communicator between worlds. And that swift communicator between worlds, he had wings on his shoes. That's the symbol of Mercury, right? The word Mercury, the origins of it... Um, I found one possible origin goes to the word Merx, M-E-R-X which was an Etruscan word that meant merchant. So the merchants, I would assume, would be on board with or maybe have prayed to uh, or sought the help of Mercury, the messenger of the gods, because communication would be essential for your business. I mean, kind of makes sense. So, and, and going back to the sulfur deal, the word sulfur, it, it means to burn. It could also mean... Um, I think it might have had another origin as soul fire, um, S-O-L for the sun, and then P-Y-R-E for pyre or fire. Um, I can't prove that one, but it seems possible that sulfur may have meant sun fire at some point, and you see a lot of sun symbolism in alchemy as well, especially associated with uh, sulfur. So. That kind of makes, that could be a possible origin. And what else do we have? We're pretty much coming up on the end of today's video. Oh yeah, sophic is a word we use to distinguish, right? So if you're talking about the alchemical constructs, uh, spiritual, uh, plant-based alchemy, you, you don't want somebody to drink metallic mercury or get confused about the message. So for this term, we'll use the word sophic mercury, S-O-P-H-I-C, sophic meaning wise. So if you hear sophic salt, sophic mercury, or sophic sulfur, that means we're dealing with a different definition for those words than the pure modern day chemistry definition. So what else do we have? That's about it. Um, <clears throat> by the way, in the uh, last video, on the Philosopher's Stone, I found one other definition of a Philosopher's Stone that said it was a red solid derived from honey through a distillation process. And uh, I don't know of anybody in modern times that's been able to do it, but supposedly it was a cure-all, fixed every disease. Maybe it was just legend. Who knows? Anyway, well, that's about enough for one day. We'll see you next time. Have a good one.